As most of you know, I'm Scottish, uh, my heritage, and um, I was raised, uh, my mom and dad, mother and father, were members of the, uh, original members of the local Presbyterian church. Uh, where I attended, I attended a school, a school that was uh, kind of like a private school, and we, uh, uh, it was a Presbyterian base, and so every uh, week we would, uh, the whole assembly would trot up to uh, the local Presbyterian, Man's Road Presbyterian Church uh, for service. And so that was my, uh, my background uh, in Christianity. And uh, one of the neat things I remember was when I first saw the, uh, it's not really a logo, but the, the uh, uh, well, I call it a logo, of the Presbyterian Church, which is the St. Andrew's Cross. Now, the St. Andrew's Cross, uh, which is the Scottish official flag, has a blue background with a diagonal white cross. It's the background of the Union Jack, which is the United a great British uh, flag. And so there was this cross on it, and then there was the bush in the middle of it, uh, representing the burning bush uh, that Moses encountered, if you remember, went Horeb. And underneath, uh, in Latin, I think it was, uh, was the legend that said, burned but not consumed. Burned but not consumed. And there's a number of reasons why they, uh, I think they chose that as their, as their uh, logo, if you will. And that is, uh, the history of Presbyterianism, there were a lot of people uh, who were burned at the stake uh, by other religious leaders from other religions, uh, well, within Christianity, that is, um, as being heretics. Because they weren't, they were just reformers, they were Protestants, uh, who were put to death by Catholics uh, in Scotland at that time. One of them was George Worship, who was burned at the stake uh, uh, in the area around St Andrews University. And so that's the, the model. And um, uh, it meant a lot to me because I thought it had a number of meanings. Uh, that uh, here was a bush uh, way back in the desert. In Sinai it burned but was not consumed, it didn't burn up. Uh, and God spoke to Moses through that bush. And what they were saying was, uh, in their log, that uh, you may kill us, but you'll never overcome us. We'll always be here, and the Presbyterian Church is still here with us today. Uh, these people were burned at the stake for their faith in Christ, they were burned, but their love and faith in Christ was not consumed. Uh, so a couple of things I want to mention about this, and that, and that is this. I, I, I'm sick and tired of, of hearing the phrase burnout, and I'm really fed up hearing it from younger people. Uh, I've both been involved in the ministry, for 30 plus years, also in corporate business. I've conducted hundreds of interviews with people, uh, managed various companies. Uh, and every now and again, you, you, you'll have some kind of conversation with somebody who is much younger uh, than you are that gives you this whole thing about, oh, I feel burned out. You ever had that? You know, some 17 year old or 18 year old is you know, burned out. Um, and on the board of New Old Air, the big uh, nursing home in Cedar Falls, and we occasionally interview people and, and listen to some folks talk about, and especially in this environment, that you know we, we kind of want to work, you know, but we kind of don't want to work five days a week. <laughs> That's like stressful, man, you know. Uh, and here's these kids that live in their parents' basement, probably, and they're trying to pick and choose, and it's getting ridiculous, it's getting crazy. And down in Austin, I was talking to my, my buddies who run companies down there, and they're, it's all over the place, it's everywhere. Just gotta get people to work, because work is stressful. <laughs> no kidding. And so, uh, you know, you get to that and you think, what do these people know about burnout? Um, well, my encouragement to them is, is read the Bible, you know, read, the, read the Acts of the Apostles, read the, the Epistles, read about the Apostle Paul. I mean, if anybody in Christendom that would have been able to say, you know what, I'm burned out, it was that guy. When you consider all the stuff that he went through for the gospel, with shipwrecks and stonings and people leaving them and abandoning them, and, and all that kind of stuff that happened to Paul throughout his ministry, not just for a little section, but for the whole lot, and he eventually ends up in a Roman prison awaiting execution for his faith in Christ. Like anybody could say, I'm, I'm burned out with this, it was Paul, but never did. And so I've always been intrigued about what is the secret to his success. I mean, how did he do all of that? 
travel all over the Mediterranean and never get burned out. With all the discouragement <coughs> he experienced, with all the things that happened to him, how did he, well, there is an answer to it. Paul was often down, but he was never counted out. He was often blitzed, but never sacked, to use a football expression. He lived his life to the max. He didn't hold back at all. He wasn't one of those guys that says, you know what, I'm going to take a sabbatical. I need a rest. I'm going to find a nice beach somewhere in Italy and sit on it for a couple of weeks and just to recharge my batteries. Uh, in fact, I've heard that from 18-year-olds recently. Recharging your batteries. Your batteries don't even run in yet to recharge it. But I've noticed over the years that, that Christians go through these phases of, of burnout for lots of different reasons. And I often wonder what, what the results of that are and what the causes of that are. Let me tell you something I've discovered in my 40 years of the ministry. When you're doing exactly what God wants you to do, you will never burn out. It's an impossibility. Now let me say it again so you get it accurately. When you're doing exactly what God wants you to do, you won't burn out. You see, it's when we start to do other things. Those are the things that cause us to burn out. I totally believe that Paul didn't burn out because he was always in the center of the will of God for his life. He was always seeking what God's desire was for how he spent his time. Not his own, but God's. I, I thought about it in, in the sense of not just burning out, but running out. There's been a number of times I've been in my car over the years. And I remember, and this is a common prayer for people who are in their car, you know, driving along, you just enjoy the countryside, you know. And, 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 and you don't even watch the gauges and, and all of a sudden you look down and there's that horrifying red thing that's kind of flashing or whatever color is in your car and, and the needle's like there and you go, oh dear Lord, you know, totally blew it. Uh, and, and what's the next prayer? What's the next prayer? Oh God, <laughs> if you get me to the next gas station, I will serve you for the rest of my life. Even pagans pray that prayer. It's amazing. If only you, and, and when you get there and you fill up, and, 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 and then you probably forget about your vow. But um, here's the signs of, of run out. You begin, so if you're in your car and you're running out of fuel, what happens next? You start to stutter, and your start, car starts to you do this thing. Oh, Lord, you know, that's not a good sign. Uh, we immediately get out. Of, if you're in the fast lane, what do you want to do? You don't want to be there, right? So you want to go over in the shoulders. You want to get away from the fast lane as the car's doing this and get pull over and signal, of course. And then what happens next? All the other cars overtake you. Boom, 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 like that. And then you eventually stop. And that's what happens spiritually. When you think about it, when you begin to run out of spiritual fuel, if you will, your spiritual life starts to stutter. If you were in the fast lane spiritually, you're not there anymore. You begin to pull over. All these other folks who are blown and going and the things of the Lord are overtaking you and you end up stopping and calling AAA and needing help to to the next gas station. Sometimes our spiritual life is like running on fumes. It's running on memories of past days when you really were on fire for the Lord. Maybe it was that youth camp many years ago. Maybe it was that conference you went to, it was that revival you had at the church, or whatever. The thing is, we can't run on fumes. And our spiritual life doesn't run on memories. Because we're only as good as we are right now. We're only as filled as we are right now. I had that when I was a, a young Christian. Um, got saved when I was 15, still in high school, and I went through that roller coaster thing, you know, you went from highs to lows, you know, Sunday at church was fantastic and it was all, and then Monday at school, not so much, 
you know, and you went through this, this kind of roller coaster Christianity of spiritual highs and spiritual lows. So how can we avoid that? How can we avoid that kind of Christianity? How can we be consistent in our love and our relationship with the Lord? How can we keep our spiritual fervor? How can we can be continually filled with the Holy Spirit? Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 11 says this. Paul says this. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never, says Paul, and he knew all about this, never be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. So he gives the church here in Rome three particular commands. He says, don't be lacking in zeal. Continue to be zealous for the Lord. Keep your spiritual fervor. Serve the Lord. The Revised Standard Version says it this way. Never flag in zeal. Be aglow with the Spirit serving the Lord. He says, never be lacking in zeal. That's to do with our mind. It's the way that we think. The reality is what we absorb is what defines us. So if you want to fill your mind and your heart with a bunch of trash, a bunch of nonsense that comes through the TV or whatever the, the source is, then that's the residue that you'll have. That's what's going to be in your mind that's going to consume your mind. That's why Paul says you know, we need to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ because there's a lot of stuff flying around that people are absorbing that does not help their spiritual life. And that's, I think, one of the problems we have with young people these days is because there's so much junk out there. There's so many thoughts, there's so many trends, there's so many different industries competing for their attention through the airwaves that it becomes confusing. And if you say something long and long enough and loud enough, people will eventually believe it. And that's why I think a lot of people are biting into this whole thing is that, you know, I feel, I feel tired, I feel burned out because that's what's coming over the airwaves. Take time for yourself. Don't apply yourself to that job. Don't apply yourself to work. It's a kind of minimalist approach to things. The reality is that our mind is a battleground continually. Paul talks about taking every thought captive and bringing it to obedience to Christ. Why is that? It's because, as I said, there's so much out there that can get us thinking in the wrong direction. Setting off thought bombs, if you will, in our mind. Thought bombs of disillusionment in God and others. Of disappointment. Of distraction. The distraction of other things. It's the other things that keep us from having that zeal for Christ, that fervor that we used to have in our hearts. We can keep our zeal by keeping our minds focused on the goal of life, and that is to love and serve Christ. Secondly, he says this, keep your spiritual fervor. That's to do with the heart. Having a spiritual passion for the Lord. Our passion is what moves us. It's what motivates us. It's what we want to do. When you wake up in the morning, what does he want to do most? For a lot of people these days, it's go back to bed. <laughs> you know, but what is it you want to achieve? What do you want? What's that day hold for you? What passion or what fervor do you have for serving the Lord on that particular day? The verb is active, by the way, in the Greek language. Keep your spiritual fervor. It's not something that God does for you. It's something that you do for God. You keep your spiritual fervor. Now, will the Holy Spirit help you with that? Absolutely. But if you want, don't want to, He won't. It's our choice. And we have the help and agency of the Holy Spirit to help us stoke the fire the flames back into to life. But sometimes we just don't want it. How do we keep our spiritual passion for the Lord? Well, let me suggest it's the same way that you would do with your husband or wife or boyfriend or girlfriend. If you want to keep that flame going, you spend time with them, don't you? 
It's hard to keep the flame going when you're living a thousand miles apart. It's proximity to the Lord that keeps our spiritual flame burning hotly. And the last thing he says is this. Serve the Lord. So if the first part had to do with our mind, and the second part of the verse had to do with our heart, what does this part have to do with? Serving the Lord. That's to do with our hands. That is putting our fervor and our passion for the Lord into play. To be active. To be doing something. Having hands that are willing to work. You see, serving the Lord means hard work. There's no getting around it. This is not, you know, somebody once said years ago, we're not called to, you know, Christianity is not a cruise line, it's a battleship. There's a thing called spiritual warfare. So we're not in kind of a cruise line just having a high old time in the high seas. Uh, we're in the middle of a war. And the way that we win that war is by serving the Lord. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10, it says this, Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. If you're going to serve the Lord, give it 110%. Don't minimalize your service for Christ. Martin Luther worked so hard that when he went to bed, he literally fell into bed. In one account, uh, a historical account, it says that he, never, he didn't make his bed for a year. Uh, he must have started his ministry as a teenager, I guess. <laughs> uh, D.L. Moody served the Lord so diligently that on one occasion it's noted that his bedtime prayer was simply, Lord, I am tired. Amen. Never prayed those prayers? John Wesley rode 60 to 70 miles a day on average and preached three sermons a day for years and years and years. Remember that it is in, it is in giving that we receive as we empty ourselves for him and for his ministry, his service, his gospel, that's when he fills us up again. I don't know if you've noticed this, but every time that I drive past Casey's or Quickstar, amazingly enough, there are cars at the pump. And there's usually a guy or a gal there holding the hose and it's got it plugged in. And, and what are they doing? Filling up, right? Because they're low on gas. I've never seen it ever happen where a moving vehicle gets filled up. Have you? Now, I know they can do aircraft and all that, but I've never seen somebody driving through cases with a pump attendant chasing them with a hose. <laughs> Doesn't happen that way. You've got to stop. It's true in the spiritual world to get continually filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit. You've got to stop and be in His presence and allow the Holy Spirit to refill you spiritually. And that's sometimes hard to do for us who are so busy with so many things we want to achieve. That's why the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. The other thing is, you can only fill something that needs filled and wants to be filled. And that's where we are as Christians. We need to want to be continually filled. That's what that verse says in the Bible. Be filled with the Spirit. The Greek verb means be being continually filled. It's not a one-time thing. It's a continual thing. And to do that, to keep our spiritual fervor, to keep that flame burning brightly for the Lord, to keep our service strong for the Lord, we need to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to have that heart of fire that is burned but not consumed, that is willing to serve the Lord with all of our heart. How can we keep that? Well, by, by having our heads, our minds that are clearly focused on the things that really matter, the things of God, 
by having hearts that are burning with a holy passion for Christ and having hands that are willing at a moment's notice to serve the Lord. That's how we keep our spiritual passion. That's how we keep a heart of fire. That's how we keep burning on for the Lord and not burning out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, your word says that the entrance of your word brings light. I pray that, Lord, you would help all of us here today to know, Lord, where we are in our spiritual life. And, Lord, whether we are half full, mostly empty, Lord, the, the good promise is that if we ask, you will continue to fill us with your presence. Help us, Lord, to be on fire for you all the time. Help us, Lord, if we've lost a little bit of that flame, if our spiritual flame needs to be rekindled, Lord, do that for us, Lord, we pray. And help us, Lord, to continually serve you effectively and faithfully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.